Greetings students and welcome to my series on advanced topics and complex variables. The purpose of this series is to use the foundation we built in my complex variables playlist and apply that foundation to more advanced topics that may come up in even higher level math and physics. In this video I'm going to be deriving some fairly important relations in physics called the kramers kronig relations. Suppose I had a complex function chi of z composed of the real functions chi1 and chi2 as the real and imaginary parts respectively. Because they're the real and imaginary parts, chi1 and chi2 are real functions, even though they take a complex number as the input they give real numbers in response to that complex input. Suppose also that chi of z is holomorphic and non-singular in the upper half of the complex plane. We'll also assume that as the magnitude of the complex number z approaches infinity, chi of z approaches zero as fast or faster than one over the magnitude of z. If these assumptions are true, then the real part of chi of z can be evaluated using the imaginary part, and the imaginary part of chi of z can be evaluated using the real part, with these two equations, where a is a real number. These are called the kramers kronig relations, and they're used quite a bit in electromagnetism, signal processing, wave propagation, really just many parts of physics where complex numbers regularly come up. Now what does this principal value term mean? Well, if you recall my video on the improper integrals in the residue theorem, links in the description, then you'll remember the Cauchy principal value. The Cauchy principal value of an improper integral from negative infinity to infinity of g of x dx is found by replacing the infinite upper and lower bounds by some parameter r, and then taking the limit of the entire integral as capital R approaches infinity. It's especially useful for some improper integrals that diverge, because the Cauchy principal value can assign a number to an integral which would otherwise diverge. This formula that I use for the Cauchy principal value applies when there's a singularity at infinity, but if there's a singularity at some finite number b in some function h of x, we can actually modify the expression for the Cauchy principal value. We use a different definition of the Cauchy principal value. So if we're, say, integrating h of x from a lower limit a to an upper limit c, and the singularity at b is somewhere in between a and c, then the Cauchy principal value of the integral is found by taking the limit as some small number epsilon approaches zero from the right, taking the limit of the sum of these two integrals. These two integrals are cleverly designed so that every part of the function h of x in the interval from a to c gets integrated except the part where h of x is singular. So this is another clever way to assign a number to an integral that would otherwise diverge due to a discontinuity at a finite number. Let's now use these three assumptions to derive the kramers kronig relations. We'll start with the integral of chi of z over z minus a over this closed semicircular contour c of radius capital R, where capital R is a really large number. The base of this contour runs along the real axis except in the area near z equals a where the contour makes a small semicircular jump over z equals a that I'll call c delta. The radius of the semicircular jump I'll call delta. In addition, I'll label this large semicircular arc as c sub r. We can break down this contour integral to four parts. The first part is the integral from negative r to a minus delta. The second part is the integral over the semicircular bump c delta. The third part is the integral from a plus delta to r. And the fourth part is the integral over the large semicircular arc c r. Now the kramers kronig relations involve integrals with infinite limits, but we don't have infinite limits right now. However, we did specify earlier that r was a very large number. So what we'll do is we'll take the limit as capital R approaches infinity. When we do that, here's what we'll get for our integral over c. Let's take another limit, but this time we'll take the limit of this equation as delta approaches zero. If we do that, here's what we'll get. Now on the right hand side, if we look at this first integral, and if we look at this third integral, then combining the two should, by definition, give us the Cauchy principal value of the integral of chi of z over z minus a from negative infinity to infinity. This is, of course, according to the Cauchy principal value formula we defined when the singularity was at a finite number. In this case, the singularity in the function we're integrating is at z equals a because z minus a is in the denominator of the integrand. Once we equate the sum of the first and third integral terms to the principal value, this equation is what we're left with. 
Let's go to the side and evaluate the integral over c delta and the integral over cr. We'll start with the integral over c delta. Now c delta is a semicircular arc with radius delta. And by the polar representation of complex numbers, we can write z as a plus the distance from the center of the circle corresponding to c delta small r times the exponential of i theta. But over the semicircular arc c delta, the distance r from the center is a constant equal to delta. So our integral becomes the following. What we want to do now is change this to an integral over theta. And if we do that, the limits on our integral now go from pi to zero because we're integrating from the left on the real axis to the right. And our differential gets converted to i delta times the exponential of i theta d theta. If we put all this together, here's what we'll get. We can then cancel these expressions to end up with the limit as delta approaches zero of the integral from pi to zero of i times chi of a plus delta times the exponential of i theta. Now as delta approaches zero, we can actually approximate the function chi of a plus delta e to the i theta as just chi of a. And after we apply this limit, we can take the chi of a outside the integral and end up with a very simple expression to integrate. At this point, it should be fairly easy to see that after all this algebra, the integral from the small semicircular bump c delta equals negative i times pi times chi of a as delta approaches zero. We're not quite done yet because we still have to evaluate the integral over the large semicircular arc c sub r. Now this semicircular arc actually stays the same regardless of the value of delta, so we'll just erase this limit. However, we did specify earlier that we took the limit as capital R approached infinity, so we'll just write that on the side to remind ourselves. Now, how do we evaluate this integral over a large semicircular arc whose radius approaches infinity? Take a moment and think about it. You can evaluate it using Jordan's lemma. However, in order to apply Jordan's lemma, three conditions are required. The first is that the function we're integrating, the chi of z over z minus a, that function is analytic everywhere beyond a certain distance from the origin, which it is. The function only has a pole at z equals a, and if we go beyond z equals a, the function is otherwise analytic, it's continuous and differentiable. The second is that we're integrating over a semicircular arc, which we obviously are. The third is that the function we're integrating has an upper limit on its magnitude over the semicircular arc c sub r, and that upper limit approaches zero as capital R approaches infinity. If all these three conditions hold, then we can safely say that this integral approaches zero as capital R approaches infinity, according to Jordan's lemma. The only thing stopping us from straight up applying Jordan's lemma is this upper limit condition, so we're gonna have to work on that. Now since we're integrating over a semicircular arc, we can write z using the polar representation of complex numbers as z equals capital R times the exponential of i theta. Note that with this polar representation, the magnitude of z on the semicircular arc will be equal to capital R. This means that the function we're integrating given this polar representation can be written in the polar form as the following. Now as capital R, which is equal to the magnitude of z, as capital R approaches infinity, chi approaches zero. This is because of the second assumption we made when we originally started this derivation. This assumption, which I'll rewrite over here, says that the magnitude of chi decreases at least as quickly as one over the magnitude of z. And because of this assumption, we can actually write chi of z or chi of r times the exponential of i theta as less than or equal to one divided by the magnitude of z, which in this case would just be one over r. I'll call this equation one. Now I've written the magnitude of chi of z this way because it decreases at least as quickly as one over the magnitude of z, which means that its rate of decrease, its derivative in other words, will always be less than or equal to the derivative of one over the magnitude of z. And if the derivative is always less than or equal to the derivative of one over the magnitude of z, that means the magnitude of the function itself must be less than or equal to one over capital R plus some constant k. But this constant k is actually just zero because we already know from the assumption that the magnitude of chi of z approaches zero as the magnitude of z or r approaches infinity. Hopefully this justification should explain why I wrote equation one the way I did. Now because the magnitude of chi of z is less than or equal to one over r, the magnitude of chi of z over z is then less than or equal to one over r times r minus a. 
And if we set 1 over r times r minus a to be the upper limit m sub r on the function chi of z over z minus a that's being integrated, we can clearly see that as capital R approaches infinity, m sub r approaches zero. So not only do we have an upper limit on the magnitude of the function chi of z over z minus a that we're integrating, but that upper limit also happens to approach zero as capital R approaches infinity. Therefore, we've successfully satisfied all the conditions of Jordan's lemma, which means that the integral over CR of chi of z over z minus a as capital R approaches infinity is just zero. Let's go all the way back to our contour integral over C of chi of z over z minus a. We'll replace the integral over C delta by negative i times pi times chi of a, and we'll cancel the integral over CR. And when we make these simplifications, here's what we'll get. For this next part, let me copy paste the drawing of the various contours we're integrating over. Now, the contour C doesn't enclose any singular points, any points over which chi of z over z minus a is undefined. So if you recall Cauchy's theorem, then the contour integral of a function over a region where that function is analytic is just zero. Therefore, we can rearrange the terms of this equation and rewrite chi of a as one over i times pi times the principal value of the integral from negative infinity to infinity of chi of z over z minus a. And I'll call this equation two. In order to get to the Kramer's Kronig relations, we'll use the fact that because chi of z is a complex function, it is composed of a real part, chi one of z, and an imaginary part, chi two of z, where chi one and chi two are both real valued functions. We can use this fact to replace the chi of z in the integral by chi one of z plus i times chi two of z, and we can also use this fact to replace chi of a by chi one of a plus i times chi two of a. Now, if the left-hand side and the right-hand side are to be equal, their real parts and their imaginary parts must be equal to each other. So what we'll do is we'll multiply the one over i times pi inside the integral, since it's just a constant, and we'll end up with the following. If we now equate the real parts of both sides using this condition, we'll get the first Kramer's Kronig relation. Then if we equate the imaginary parts, we'll get the second Kramer's Kronig relation. And this completes our derivation for the Kramer's Kronig relations. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these relations are quite useful because they allow you to determine the real part of a complex function in terms of the imaginary part and vice versa. This is why they come up in so many places in physics. Just one final note, I've used the pronunciation chi to refer to the function chi, but there's other sources that might pronounce it as key, kind of like the key blade in Kingdom Hearts. Hopefully my chi pronunciation doesn't irritate you too much, but if it does, you can always write a mean-spirited comment below. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.